All right, so hi there. My name is Hui Ling, and uh, I'm a lecturer in music studies at the Yong Siu Conservatory of Music. And I'm really happy today to welcome you to Yong Siu um, virtual forum series. And today's topic is that teacher behind the screen, is it human? And of course, it could also be read as is IT human? All right, so before we even start this presentation, I just wanted to say a big thank you to all those who agreed to be interviewed for this presentation. So thank you to Leonie, uh, Shuwen, Cast, Gabriel, and Ryan, whom you all will meet in time to come. All right, so why this topic? All right, well, online teaching has been the talk of the town. It's you know, there's so much hype surrounding it because of the pandemic. It has forced a lot of us teachers to bring our teaching online. But actually, if you think about it, this concept of online teaching, this concept of distance learning is not a new one. So in the mid 1920s, one commentator reported visions of radio producing a super radio orchestra and a super radio university wherein every home has the potentiality of becoming an extension of Carnegie Hall or Harvard University. And then 30 years later, in the late 1950s, visions of the potential impact of educational television were even more grandiose than those of the radio had been. And I understand uh, uh, these educational uh, television to be the documentaries that we know today. And it's really been, uh, it's really had a huge impact in transferring knowledge and information to lots of people. So this idea of online teaching isn't new at all, but for most of us teachers, we are too used to teaching face to face. And so when the pandemic came, it was a huge, big, steep learning curve for many of us. And I think, you know, myself included, a lot of educators, uh, I think we were struck by anxiety paralysis. We started asking ourselves when we had to shift our learning online, oh my goodness, what platform should we use? Is it Zoom? Is it Microsoft Teams? Should we use Google Hangouts? Oh, there's also WebEx. Wait, which one is better? What is the difference? Um, and then after that, we settled which online platform to use. Then the next quick question came up. How do we even set up for online teaching? And then especially if you're playing piano, how many cameras do you need? You know, well, thankfully, in a short amount of time, uh, a lot of information came out over the web on how to deal with these issues. So today, today's session is really not about how to teach online, but rather it's about discussing the human issues behind teaching online. So some would argue that teaching online is just as good as face-to-face, -face, right? Students get the information that they need all the same. But some would argue that it's never gonna be as good as face-to-face -face simply because of a lack of human presence. And so that brings us to the crux of today's presentation. So these are the key questions we'll be discussing today. First, what does it even mean to be human in music teaching? Number two, did online teaching amplify, diminish, or create new human qualities? And number three, what future possibilities and implications are there? So in my quest to answer these questions, here's what I did. I interviewed seven individuals who had experience with either online teaching or learning, and I interviewed them individually. Now, I interviewed them individually because I did not want them to be influenced by others in a group setting. So I had to resist the temptation to invite, to invite them over today for a Zoom panel session. I felt that that wouldn't have been so effective. So let's hear from these seven individuals. Short introduction to them. be teaching some music theory, general music theory, analysis, composition, and improvisation to different musicians. I mean, improvisation for pianists and improvisations for small ensembles. Mm. So I've been teaching uh, instrumental teaching, which is basically uh, teaching the violin online mainly, but I've also been teaching uh, a subject called teaching music online uh, in a range of formats. So both 
in person as well as online and I also did some recorded tutorial videos sharing tips on how to teach online uh, which was commissioned by the ABRSM. As before the circuit breaker, things were the usual. So we did playing of the piano, um, some we did duets, some two piano works, depending on what students um, we had, as well as movement, um, singing, um, discussion, theory, everything all together. So whatever that we did normally, we tried to do it online. I've been in touch and working with lots of teachers who are doing this. So I've had lots of feedback from different people and we've been doing mm. focus groups and things about this. Okay, so we had online lessons with uh, both the piano and the violin actually. Mm -hmm. Ah! And theory, yeah, she had online lessons with theory as well. So during summer, I took part in the Bowden International Music Festival and I had some online classes for performance um, lessons. Then for this academic semester, I have an online academic module. All right, so there you have it, our seven superstars of today. Um, and then if you notice, um, amongst the seven of them, there is a huge uh, range of ages. The youngest uh, is a young student, and she's nine years old. And the oldest there, whom I won't point out, uh, I, I believe is in his late 50s. So a whole uh, range of ages there. All right. We also have a range of experiences. So instead of just instrumental music teachers, we also have academic music teachers there. And amongst the mix of instrumental music teachers, some of them teach solo, ensemble, uh, improvisation, and theory. So it's a very diverse group. All right. Furthermore, uh, the, the seven individuals provide a range of perspectives because they are teachers, they are parents, and they are students as well. So what I wanted to get was a holistic and diverse range of views to explore the key questions. So let's move on to our first key question. What does it mean to be human in our teaching? Now, after talking to these seven individuals, I realized that uh, what makes us human can be, at least in our teaching, can be, can be separated into two categories, communication and understanding. Let's first look at communication. Communication is a two-way interaction. And so, you know, remember just now we talked about online teaching or distance learning as not being a new concept. Actually, today it is quite different from before because with radio programs and documentaries, the, the flow of information is one way, right? But today with online teaching, there's actually a two-way interaction. And so this communication, this interaction, is uh, really important. So let's hear a bit more about what communication means, what it means to be human in our communication before we talk about understanding, which is the second category. The center of our teaching is not exams, not music. I would even say music comes second. But it has to be the person, the human. It's called Ren. Yeah. I would even explore this with my students. We actually draw a circle and say, what's at the center of all this weekly meet up? You know? Then we come round and round and say, Do you know it's actually you and me? Me, you know, we're humans, we're interacting. And they say, Yeah, it's true. I think even a young child walking out, I feel good. Like, hey, I'm being listened to. It is that now that they are on social distancing? can't hang out and chat anyway so it's kind of almost futile to go to school because it's not like they can play with their friends so I think a lot of the kids there's a lot of pent-up angst you know amongst them because they can't run around and play like they used to it's down no three people share one table yes so then eat then put back your plate sit there for the whole recess and you're not allowed to talk to each other so you just look at each other and eat yeah and of course they talk secretly but they're literally not allowed to get out of there Seat and like run around in the fields like they used to. No, I actually have play area, but then my class don't even have play area. So bad. Yeah. So what if what if you have recess mm -hmm. and then everybody their own table, but then we put in front of everybody a computer screen and then like zoom like that, and then you can chat with your friend. Would that actually be more fun? Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's more fun than just sitting down next to a person but not being able to talk, right? Mm. Yeah. It is interaction. <laughs> The screen is only a way of communicating, but how are the two parties or more parties, you know, engaging 
in this conversation or bringing across what we can offer to the other human and vice versa. Isn't it interesting that, you know, sometimes we learn so much from children that in their innocent anecdotes, we can actually glean the most wise of insights there. So, well, anyway, we'll get to that. Um, after listening to what the interviewees had to say about communication, I realized that communication can be broken down further into three categories, oral, visual, and physical. So let's take a look at oral and what it means. What it means is basically uh, how we are listening and perceiving information. It also refers to verbal, how we are giving out information. So when my young student uh, talked about her recess time, she said that uh, she would rather be seat, uh, sitting very far away from her friends, but have a screen in front of her so that she could talk to her friends. She would rather that than to be sitting near her friends, but not being able to talk at all. And I think that just goes to show how important this oral element is in communication. Now, the visual. <clears throat> it's really interesting if we notice that none of them talked about the visual. In fact, it was assumed that we would be able to see the other person when we communicate. So Julie mentioned that the screen, and she acknowledged the screen is a medium in which to communicate. And I think this just goes to show how important the visual element is to communication. Finally, the physical, it means physical presence, being there in person, our body language, right? When Leonie mentioned um, that there's a lot of pent up angst in children because they're not able to run around and play with each other, I think that shows how important the physical element is in communication. So the three sub elements of communication, the oral, visual and physical. All right, now we go on to look at what it means to be understanding as a human. Um, well, I mean, if I go online and check what understanding means, it would, you know, the search result would come out and it would say sympathetic awareness. And I think that basically explains it. Um, so in order to understand better what understanding really means in terms of teaching, I posed this question to the interviewees. What three human qualities should every teacher have? And uh, here is a compilation of the top four. The first one is empathy. So, well, maybe a computer could be sophisticated enough to read your emotions, but also um, it's not just being able, to, being able to read a student's emotion, it's then knowing what to say and how to adapt in that scenario. And that's conditional on so many things, the student, their background, the day of the week, <laughs> where we are, you know, and those are all intuitive things that only a human and a teacher can read and be able to respond to. So, um, so therefore, empathy is something which I think can only effectively be delivered by a human. So I'm interested in the person before me and say, hey, what is it that I can understand from this person in order to make links? Uh, well, I, if I think about my own teachers, the teachers that I thought were most human were very often teachers that know how to emphasize with the, with the student's situation and also with the, the knowledge and the position of a student. And because I think that if you um, look at a teacher and the teacher is like a machine and you, you think you, if you don't identify, if you don't see yourself becoming that later, then this disconnection is not very human. So that's empathy. The second one was the ability to read the student and therefore inspire the student. I think more importantly, a good teacher inspires a child. And I can tell you from a parent's perspective that it really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. It's knowing how to play to your student's strengths and kind of knowing when to kind of like you know, turn up the volume and where to tone it down. Actually, yeah. actually, because that's that 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 push pull is is something that I think I guess the computer cannot do, right? It's yeah. it's, it's it's judgment. It comes with years of experience. Aha! Yeah. Uh -huh, the light bulb, or you know, you're guiding them and say, yes, it means it's this, 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 this. I say exactly. Rather than I say for you, you have consolidated and 
constructed and put all these things together. Teaching is more of calling than a job. You know, if you treat it as a job where you're, you know, just basically um, how much you're making per hour, then um, it really takes the human uh, thing out of teaching, right? Kind of, you know, seeing this as a calling and um, really always thinking how you can make the student grow, um, help the student along, you know, being a cheerleader, um, I think uh, are really, really important qualities uh, that every teacher should have. You know, it's, it's something you can't actually teach, um, you know, a passion, but uh, all we can do is share it and hope that it rubs off on our students, which is usually, I think, how it most effectively works. But um, passion comes out of some a, a, a very personal and unique place, right? Um, and so uh, that is um, an important human element that can't be auto-generated, I think. So that's a Oh, sorry, that's our next slide already. But, you know, before we even go on, I just wanted to add that, you know, being able to inspire and read our students, uh, this point is actually linked to empathy because without empathy, we can't actually read our student and therefore inspire our students. Um, in fact, I'll go as far as to say our next point about rapport. If we don't have rapport with the student, actually, we probably won't be able to read and inspire the student as well. So let's hear a bit more about rapport from our interviewees. The secondary school group that I mentioned just now, um, the one that I teach, I coach the violence section, um, I felt that we really were able to develop a, a very good camaraderie um, before the switch to online teaching, when they had the new batch coming in and, and the old batch were graduating. Um, yeah, we would have very, very, um, you know, very fun sessions, interactive sessions where we would incorporate like improvisation, uh, you know, just cool exercises that, that will make them, uh, you know, all laugh, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, it, it, we actually developed like, you know, real, real friendship that, that, were, that was carried through even after uh, they graduated, you know, we still have a WhatsApp group, uh, anyone's birthday, they would still like, you know, send birthday messages and teachers day, they were all like sending messages in that same WhatsApp group as well. So, you know, being able to develop um, friendship even beyond the classroom and that, that camaraderie, I guess, really was, was quite rewarding for me, the feeling that, you know, everyone actually really enjoyed these, these sessions. Mm -hmm. Third quality a teacher has some kind of humor. Mm. <laughs> I think you know, or, or can maybe, or, or or maybe even some kind of self criticism, or or mm. uh, can laugh a little bit about some things or relativize things. I would say approachable, friendly, and caring. Right, I think Shu Wen uh, summed it up very nicely: approachable, friendly, and caring. The Sorry. Secondary school group that I mentioned. <laughs> All right, about. and. Uh, so yeah, I think she sums up very beautifully what rapport is. And, you know, just to note that I think this rapport, this chemistry that we have with our students is so much more important for instrumental music teachers because I don't know of any other field where the teacher spends one-on-one -on -one time with a student every single week exclusively. And... Uh, that goes to show how much and how important the relationship with the student is. Because if the relationship is not good, the teaching will not work. And so I would say rapport is really important here. Now, um, the one that Finally, our last quality is vulnerability. I used to like teachers who would kind of question their own knowledge. Mm. So they would kind of say it's like this and this, and then they would maybe say, but maybe, yeah, well, if I think again, you know, like, so this kind of teachers who, who, who dare to doubt something or who dare to, um, yeah, to make a mistake even. You know, I think, oh, wow, I really admire this teacher, but it's something that I could be maybe in the future right. too, you know. I think it's important to not just show that, uh, you know, you're a brilliant player when you're teaching, but also to 
to uh, show, show all these human qualities that we just talked about earlier so that the student would also want to be like that. Just being able to relate because like, for example, my academic module, right? Um, I think both of the teachers sometimes, <laughs> sometimes like, have some small little crisis on like te uh, online techniques and I can totally relate because I'm just like them and it, <laughs> there's this like funny quality that's, that is input into the lessons which I think makes it like actually quite enjoyable <laughs> Because you see a side of them in person, like, everything is in control, but then suddenly you see them. Hey, my eye, my eye, my eye. All right, I'm just going to be really upfront here that uh, the two teachers that Shuan is talking about is myself and um, Dr. Abigail Sin. Uh, and we co-teach this class called Reimagining Pianism. And I can't tell you how many times we have exchanged uh, WhatsApp messages on our frustrations you know, with, with the things that have gone wrong this semester with online teaching. And we are always beating ourselves up because we are always thinking, oh, you know, we should have done that better. We should have done this better. And so when Shuwen actually mentioned that, you know, it makes us seem more human, more vulnerable, I must say that actually was quite heartwarming to hear. Yeah. So. Oops. So here we are, the next slide. It's a summary of everything. So the aspects of understanding, the top four aspects are empathy, knowing how to read and inspire the student, rapport and vulnerability. So maybe just take a while to take in this diagram before we go on to the next key question. Okay. And the next key question is, how has online teaching altered our humanness? In other words, has it uh, diminished, amplified, or created new human qualities? And here's what we're going to do. Okay, Remember our uh, three aspects of communication, right? Oral, visual, and physical. Uh, we'll be looking at how online teaching has affected these three aspects of communication one by one. And at the same time, we'll be evaluating, all right, how, how empathy, knowing how to read and inspire the student, rapport and vulnerability were likewise affected when teaching was taken online. Okay, so that will be the order of analysis that will go by. So let's hear this first segment of interviews. It's about accepting physical limitations and this deals with the physical aspect of communication. Like I had, I have like, you know, lessons with younger children as well. And I can see that the piano yeah, teachers, yeah. yeah, the piano teachers like, you know, patients like really wearing out or the child's like running around can't physically like grab them and tell them to sit still, right? Yeah, so... Imagine, imagine there's like, if you, you see a person right on the screen, right? Then you put your hand through and you're already at the person's house. Yeah, it's as, if, it's as if they wanted to do that, right? <laughs> yes. And I guess the, the difference also is that in per when you're teaching in person, you know, you can really go around the room and, and you know, look at the students playing from different angles. Um, adjusting the student's posture and stuff like that. So then you get a little bit more of that um, energy around the room. But I guess, you know, when you're teaching in front of a screen, then you really have to make use of this space here to, to express yourself. You know? I just hope that people understand that, you know, the nature of the performance grade, you know, whereby you're doing, a, you, you're recording yourself perform, it, it, it is still a performance, even though technically you can achieve that without performing to an audience. I hope, and I even hope this for people who do normal exams, you know, is that when they are preparing all those pieces, um, whether it's for an, a practical exam or a performance grade, that they are performing to people and performing to an audience. It's just in the live exam that automatically happens because there is an examiner in the room who you have to play to. Uh, whereas in this online world, well, technically I could, if I have a piano in my bedroom, I could just record it there and no one has to listen to me apart from me. <laughs> it's very different. There are certain passages in music which honestly I think sound a lot 
like sound like there's more gravitas when you hear it live. So for example, it could be like oh, very energy, very energetic, uh, passage. Then after that, suddenly it's like, like there's this halt, and then there's this like sense of change. You know, sometimes when you sit in the audience and you listen to something like that, it becomes like very deep, very profound. But then across the screen, you don't really know whether that's coming across. So I tried literally to play with an ensemble online. Uh, and even we got two programs working at the same time, so Zoom for the video and then uh, generators for, for audio. And I mean, it, it works to a certain extent, but it still didn't work. So I noticed that when we turned those processes into something indirect, it would be actually online much more effective. So to give an example of that, I would have students simply record themselves on video playing an improvisation, for example, solo improvisation, and then share the video materials and then discuss those. Mm. And those, those ways of working work to work much, much better. Usually what I do with students is that they come with some work in the classroom and then I take it in and then I go home and then a few days later I might, you know, like make some notes and then go back to the class situation. But now actually I discovered more a model where they would um, give me smaller chunks of, of written work and I would immediately, I would put them in a breakout group to discuss something and I would immediately come back with annotated versions that could then be, be sort of uh, dealt with or it could be discussed and they could, I, I found sort of a, there was a very direct sort of ping pong way of working that you can create in an mm. online environment. In a class, I mean, you can really look at someone and say, and what about you? But in, in, in somehow there were students who just like managed to get themselves out of the picture, <laughs> literally. Literally also, sometimes, you know, switching the camera off. Uh, and then I would say, can you switch your camera on? And they would say, you know, I have some technical problem. Right. You know, some these, these strategies of hiding, it may have been true, but maybe not. Yeah. On the student side, I think some of us are, um, don't participate as much as we would normally in person because like it feels weird to sort of like have to unmute yourself and then like say something and then mute yourself and all that happens in like a sliver of a second so like the teacher might be like oh who's that you know <laughs> yeah I mean if I were in class in person I'll be like well there's just that human connection that you can't really replicate online i'll be like oh blah, blah, and i'll like participate you know very naturally um and it depends on the individual personalities of everyone as well but online it's like huh i need to unmute myself to ah it's like it's just so weird so a lot of uh, insights that we can um, get out of this short segment of interviews i think the first thing is that we that we can acknowledge is that um, the physical presence and the energy of the classroom is hugely diminished uh, when the lessons are taken online. And as a result, it becomes much harder for the teacher to read the student or inspire the student. I mean, how can we even read a student when the videos are off or when they might be hiding behind the camera, right? It's impossible in many ways. Um, second point to note is that silence takes on a whole new meaning when it's online. So Shu Wen was mentioning that, you know, when, when in an actual performance, there is a halt or a silence that's full of anticipation, it's palpable. The audience can feel it. But when it's online, part of that magic disappears. And so this brings to mind that, that aspect of understanding called empathy. Perhaps it's much easier to empathize when there is a live presence. Finally, Cast mentions this, um, uh, that there is a reversal of what is direct and indirect. So for example, when, you know, when students are working on zombies or, you know, when we are talking about classroom participation, mm, in a real life setting, that communication is direct, right? But now when it's taken online because of the physical space, suddenly it becomes indirect. As Shu Wen says, it's a huge, I mean, it's, it's like adding extra layers of step to unmute yourself, say something, and then after that, mute yourself back, and you might be interrupted and teacher may not hear you. And so, you know, with these difficulties, it's really hard for the student to build a rapport with the teacher. In fact, you know, having it online, in a way, almost discourages that. And so if I were to sum it up, I think, 
you know, to a large extent, in fact, to a very, very large extent, online teaching uh, takes away from the physical element of communication. And it definitely has drawbacks in terms of being able to read and inspire a student, being able to empathize, and being able to create rapport with our students. Let's go on to the next aspect of communication, uh, that is the oral and verbal. All right, and online teaching definitely had a huge impact on this. So let's hear what our interviewees had to say about that. You know, you always want to, um, you know, have either a visual uh, representation of a person that you're talking to and also the, the audio representation. And it's in the group setting, sometimes they tend to want to switch off the camera uh, and definitely everyone will be muted unless they, you know, have, have a question and then they'll unmute themselves. Um, so a lot of times you, you, you probably feel a little bit like you're, you're like in outer space and you're kind of by yourself, but actually people are still listening in. So it's, it's a switch in the, in the mentality, I guess, that, that you always need to be uh, aware that even though you're not seeing everyone, that, that people are, are there listening to you. Definitely. I mean, definitely online teaching is much more tiring uh, because very often you get nothing back. So you have the feeling that you have to speak louder somehow or more clearly. Mm. Uh, and I never got this, you know, when you're in a real lesson, you can be relaxed and you can actually tone down and you, you don't have to speak loud at all. And you can actually, if you do that, you notice there's more attention than when you try to shout. But online, I always had the feeling that I had to overdo it and I got very tired of online sessions. Um, I, I have realized myself that um, I'm less likely to to, to crack jokes because every time I crack joke crack a joke no one is gonna laugh right mm -hmm. they're all muted so then then there's lesser um, uh, yeah I'm, I'm less likely to, to to keep cracking jokes as compared to a real life session so uh, that, that I guess is one of the, the limitations of um, you know being in a zoom session for a sectional or group setting you have to shout more yeah. did you feel anything different no no you didn't okay. I think as, as a parent, I think it was obvious that everyone was very frustrated. Oh, is it? Yes. Having a wired versus a non-wired connection helps as well. Mm. A wired connection helps greatly with upload speed, so the teacher sees a lot less lag and it's, it seems to be a bit more reactive to what you're playing because, you know, I think on one end, every time you're, you know, you're, 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 you're playing something and then there's like a long pause if, and you have to wait for the, you know, for the, for, for, for the information to reach the other end and then for the person as well to react. So there's like this huge pause in between, mm. which is what you don't normally get, you know, which, which is what you don't get at all with physical lessons because the, yeah. the feedback is instantaneous pretty much. But basically their Wi-Fi um, was really a, a huge disturbance. So they became very challenging because all of a sudden you can have hang yeah. um, situation. Or it just you know goes out and and it stalls because being online has has a little bit of that na less natural organic feel to conversation um, and definitely that that little bit of a lack giving a little bit of an awkward silence kind of thing uh, makes it a little bit less human I would say Also, the backdrop of having to teach online is quite a challenging and difficult one. I mean, the reason why we're all doing this is because of a pandemic and everyone's stuck at home. And, and of course, it's going to have an impact on everyone's mental health, you know, not just the students, but the, 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 the support system around them as well. So, so as teachers, you know, that, that communication about just asking them to emote and talk about the, the, their feelings and things is important, but also being able to unlock sort of the expressive potential in playing as well will also help and support children in their lives so um so it's kind of more important than ever that we have music and arts and what have you um so yeah we're just i'm just i think we should be very thank thankful that we still have an interface in you which know we i think ryan is it. always <laughs> such a sweetheart because he's always able to bring a positive spin 
to anything negative. And that's wonderful. And it is true uh, in this day and age, I wouldn't say in this day and age, but you know, uh, when, when the pandemic hit, um, I mean, we can talk about how bad the connection was and how all our struggles, but really it did managed to um, help a lot of us connect with each other. And that was a wonderful thing. But despite all that, really, the, the, a lot of the descriptions that I'm hearing here with the, you know, uh, diminished audio quality, uh, you know, there are adjectives like tiring, frustrated, a disturbance, it was less organic, it was less human, uh, it was less natural. Um, and Gabriel, you know, found it hard to be his usual humorous self even. And so I think, you know, when all that is in, in place, you have, have all these feelings inside as an educator, it's really hard to find the inspiration to be inspiring with our students when we're feeling all those 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 emotions there. And what more rapport, right? So I think by and large, um, online teaching really um, diminished this oral verbal aspect of communication there. But that being said, all right, there were ways to overcome uh, some of the drawbacks in this oral aspect of communication, and that was through asynchronistic teaching. So let's hear what our interviewees have to say about that. Making greater use of pre-recordings and uh, you know the student recording practice, uh, not necessarily always performing live over the lesson, but maybe recording something earlier, which they then discuss live over the lesson, and and building that into their uh, teaching approach and learning approach. So um, much more. Um, I mean, obviously, it's great anyway for performers, but it's something which isn't always instinctive, especially when you just rely on the live lesson each week. So actually, I, I felt that this new practice has helped, you know, students to become more reflective and critical and listen to themselves and appraise themselves more. We always face like problems like sound quality and latency issues, which are a natural thing as a result of connectivity problems. So what I did was um, I would record myself playing the thesis first. And then I would send it over via email and along in the email I would attach in prose what were some of the physical problems I was facing as I learned the piece. And this would give the classes a lot more like goal-oriented outlook and then we could be more focused. When you do lessons online, I guess the student can be more initiated mm. and like can decide what he or she wants to work on for that lesson and like maybe um, influence the teacher's direction during the class. Mm. In person, the classes are, I think, more teacher-led, even though the student can still ask questions that can also direct the conversation elsewhere. All right, so I think what we're hearing is that asynchronistic teaching or pre-recordings uh, can, to a certain extent, help us overcome the drawbacks experienced with audio quality in online teaching. And going a step further from that, if we listen to what Shuwen said, it actually encouraged her to be much more initiative, to actually take the lead in deciding uh, how she wanted, uh, the direction in which she wanted um, her lessons uh, to take. And in this sense, I thought it was wonderful because now the student is encouraged to be the one to create rapport the student is now encouraged to show a more vulnerable side to themselves. And these are all human aspects that we've discussed just now, except we are seeing it now more from, a, from the students rather than the teachers. That being said, though, here's the disclaimer. Okay, I shouldn't say disclaimer, but the fact is that Shuan is quite the model student. All right, so uh, that's that. Let's go on for now. All right, and let's focus now on the third aspect of communication, and that's the visual. I mean, I think that we as musicians probably have faced the, the biggest challenges of, of, of all. Um, because music is basically an art of the senses. It's not just an art of hearing and listening, but actually 
I discovered that it's so much also about visual cues that you get from each other. So just really focusing on the visual uh, might, might be a bit more effective. You can really focus on the things that you can correct visually. Um, for violin, it's actually very visual because you know whether your bow is sliding around on the string, whether it's straight, whether your, your bow hold is good. Stuff like that can, can really be diagnosed and picked up very easily. Try not to, say, like raise your voice while the student is playing, you know, in order to stop the student. Maybe you can just like, this for me, I actually just put my hand right in front of the camera so that they're like, oh, suddenly like, you know, the, the screen is blocked. And then they're like, okay, I need to stop. Instead of like, sometimes they just go on and on. And even when you're like saying, saying like, stop, 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 they're still not really hearing you, right? So um, yeah, covering, covering the webcam, or like uh, visual cues like, you know, sharper, flat, that kind of stuff. Um, and maybe a little bit of conducting also sometimes while they're playing uh, helps, helps the music a little bit. Maybe it can be, you can compare it, you know, like an actor being on stage for an audience or an actor being on television with, you know, the face, <laughs> big face on the screen you feel somehow that you're you're augmented in your facial expression and in you know the, that and the rest of you is actually not there so body language in the traditional sense i don't think really exists very much online but facial expression and it's somehow more direct did it matter to have my face there i think it adds the human element yes especially for young children we're used to looking at someone's face to read their facial expressions and facial cues to know if they're happy or unhappy with you know whatever we're playing. So there's just it's also a kind of feedback you see. I mean if you if you if you're playing your, your piano and you see your teacher going, oh you, you know you're doing something wrong. So you know you're basically teaching into a mirror, right? You can see how exactly you look, and you can adjust this thing. So in that sense, we are developing, um, you know, our body language while we are teaching. We are, we 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 are more aware of our expression when you are teaching as well. You know, sometimes maybe you don't intend to, to really be frowning so much uh, when the student is playing, but you know, the student is playing really out of tune and you want to be more encouraging. So maybe you'll be more aware of that, right? So maybe you, uh, you just slightly alter your look a little bit more. And um, I guess that, that kind of helps us to develop things that we never really uh, realize in an in-person session when we don't have a mirror in front of us. Because when a child is looking at a smaller screen, it just somehow doesn't grab their attention, even though the image is one and the same. I know what you should do. Oh. You take a picture of the teacher face, and then after that, you put it right in front of the piano. <laughs> Maybe we should do that most of the time, right? Would that help in your daily you practice? Put a TV right in. But so if you take a picture of me now, and then you put it in your practice like, every day, would that help motivate you? Actually? Seriously, yeah, yeah. though? I think it Seriously. would. You feel like Big Brother is watching. <laughs> I think I'll just laugh at it all day. Mm, some students were using mobile phone and looking through that. I say, no, no, that's not going to be really good. And if you're able to, you know, um, substitute it with a laptop at least. But on the other end, we, I also had students who, you know, really brought in their TV screen. Or let's say they could shift their piano or their um, electronic, you know, clavinova type put it in front of the TV and they do all the setup. So you have these kind of um, extend as well. I think, I, th I think, you know, like when somebody is explaining something on the score, like you know, you, it, it helps to have a score view because, you know, so it's something with a multiple camera angle actually works. And, you know, if you have basically one device only streaming, with a couple of cameras, actually, that works the best. Like basically, what you did, mm. you know, you could you could uh, switch the angle and you say, okay, this is this is the bit of the score that we're talking about. Because if not, if you just if, if it's just obviously on the hand, then you're trying to explain to someone. Oh, share screen. Oh yeah, share screen exactly. You know, so if you're trying to explain to someone, they may not necessarily know what you're talking about because you're both not explaining okay. everything. Yeah. So I would have all these scores open on desktop, and then I would sh screen share. And that's where the students really enjoyed the sharing, the annotation bit. Now, initially, of course, the kids, the students um, had to also be 
familiar with such a technology. They were all very intrigued, you know, like, what's this and all that. Okay, once that kind of um, part dies down, then it came to the screen share. You found that they were also um, chipping in, sharing and saying, okay, and the doodling out and all that. Uh, to give an example, if you're on Zoom and you're looking at each other, I mean, you, you're just actually not looking at each other. So, I mean, the camera is in a different place. Um, you just have simply no idea when you're actually in touch with another person. It's, it, it's, it's a distorted reality. I, I have trouble there because you want to look at the screen. But that's not necessarily, then the, the others are not necessarily seeing your eyes because yeah. you might look away for them. Yeah. You know, and then when you look at the camera, depending on what it is, then you can look at the screen at the same time. So mm. there is something very tiring going on. I think this could only be solved if they create screens with cameras I inside. I agree with that actually. I, I always feel that I can't connect 100% with students or the other human across the screen because I feel like I have to look through the camera camera to talk to them and I don't see their eyes when that happens so that that really indeed is frustrating but you know by and large I think what I'm getting from hearing uh, uh, the interviews is that uh, online teaching has really heightened our awareness of facial expressions and having a big screen heightens it even further and so much of communication depends on facial expressions. It, we rely on it to tell someone else's emotions. And so in this sense, I think, you know, online teaching really amplified this visual aspect of communication and helped us to empathize more through facial expressions uh, with our students. And, you know, I, I'd just like to share that for me when Gabriel said that the mirror, uh, Teaching online is as if we are always constantly looking in a mirror. It's true because I, I feel like I became a better teacher by knowing how to regulate my expressions uh, when I teach. And so I'm actually quite relieved to hear that my young student finds looking at my face humorous. And I think it's a good thing because that is precisely what builds rapport. Um, finally, the last point that I wanted to mention uh, with regards to this set of interviews is that uh, the online features such as screen sharing all right, really did wonders. It helped to grab the attention of students and it actually invited them to participate, especially with you know, younger students who are so adept at technology anyway. And so this makes up for some of the drawbacks that we talked about earlier. And uh, in a way, it was a new path that I found uh, that I could rely on to inspire students. And so by and large, even though uh, there's still a bit of distortion in the sense that we don't, you know, we can't see straight into the other person's face, by and large, I think uh, online teaching amplified the visual aspect of communication. So we've talked about now, we've talked about how online teaching um, affects the oral, the visual and physical aspects of communication. And this is where we stand right now. It took away from the oral aspect. That's why we have a sad face. Uh, I think it magnified the visual aspect of communication. So we have a smiley face, all right? And uh, definitely took away from the physical aspect. So sad face, all right? And at the same time, all right, see these aspects here, empathy, being able to inspire the student and you know, building rapport. These are what I call the gray areas. And that's why we have a emotionless face or maybe a better word, it's a neutral face. All right, because, uh, you know, I guess with the oral and physical aspects of communication uh, being diminished, it took away from these aspects here, these aspects of understanding. But because, because uh, online teaching magnified the human aspect of visual communication, it kind of made up for what we lacked before. And so these are what I call the gray areas, all right? Vulnerability, I, I gave it a smiley face. Actually, no one really mentioned it in, in the previous set of interviews. But if you recall, Shuwen actually mentioned that um, uh, she found it funny <laughs> to, to see the teacher's vulnerable sides when they were, when they were um, 
dealing with with tech problems. I have another story to share. Actually, I was actually in a Zoom meeting not too long ago, and I have a very adorable five year old nephew, and he had just finished answering the call of nature, and he decided to drop into my room to see if I was free to play with him. He was not totally dressed, and he started bouncing in front of the camera. And I was appalled. I quickly, like, you know, I put my hand in front of the screen and I tried to shut him out. <laughs> I chased him out of the room in the end, uh, but not quite fast enough. Uh, it was just, you know, on, at first it was quite embarrassing for me. But then after that, I realized that everybody else started asking me about my nephew and he commented on how adorable he was. And, you know, I thought about it. Yeah, actually, you know, this online medium can really sometimes draw out the most vulnerable sides of us that we won't normally share in official settings. And that is quite human as well. So that's something which, you know, a, a positive aspect. So I put a smiley face here. So in dealing with these gray aspects, you know, I just wanted to add that actually there are many more ways that we can make up for these gray areas here. All right, and that's what we'll be exploring next. So one way uh, is to make up with using much more energy, which is actually what I'm trying to do right now. But let's hear what our interviewees say about it. I think for academic classes, um, because I've had the I've had in-person classes with two two of the same teachers before, um, online they still seem about the same like still very cocky and fun uh, which i really appreciate and like but i think um it's more in terms of like how they engage with the class that changes um although they ask questions in person as well but i think online uh, they try and make the class participate more how about you for me the online teaching encouraged me to ask my students more questions yes now when we come online um, there are other things that I may not be able to access. Um, so I noticed that I had to be even more deliberate in my speech. I probably have to speak slower, uh, much slower, or I have to articulate, or I have to exaggerate. Um, as, as, and especially then when you're actually teaching and you're doing something which is inherently expressive and uh, involves sort of human connection and, and what have you and uh, creating art and everything. Uh, the need for the teacher is the stimulus and as the inspiration uh, is so important anyway. But then online I found, you know, and, and again through teachers I've spoken to, they've had to make an even bigger effort to find those energy reserves, you know, to be really effusive, really encouraging. Um, to be using lots of creative language, all those sorts of things. It takes a lot more effort to teach online. Um, and if you really, uh, you know, are, are really putting in the effort um, outside of the time that you have with the student, you know, maybe to review their practice videos, to give them comments uh, outside of the actual, actual session, um, I think it takes a lot of effort. And um, in that sense, I think the student can sense that you are um, really concerned about their progress. I guess in, in, in that sense, um, you know, the human qualities of the teacher being very caring and, um, you know, very giving in that sense so will, will be amplified. All right. So in, in terms of, you know, uh, making up with more energy, um, I think teachers in general try to be much more proactive. They exaggerate a lot more and the caring ones are not afraid. In fact, they will go the extra mile to put in the extra time to make sure online teaching goes well for their students. And in this sense, I think that really helps to make up for the aspects of understanding, such as you know being able to inspire the student, empathy, as well as rapport. Okay. Now, online teaching also gives many educators a uh, chance to peek into the student's learning environment. So let's hear more. So it's like a third eye going into your home to see how it's set up. Sometimes I would say, 
please show me your living room or your you know setup because I want to have a sense of of how your piano is set up because I think the teacher also has to advise um, the student whether the piano is placed in a conducive area. For those who I have not visited before, it meant that, oh yes, I know why. Okay, this could be another reason why. Teachers had reported that actually having parents obviously more involved in the weekly lessons for this reason, um, even if they were just setting it up and then leaving, you know, at least they still were in touch with the parent for part of the lesson, if not the whole of it, also meant that the parents themselves took a greater sort of interest and understanding in what, what is a music lesson, how does it unfold, what does it involve, and all those sorts of things which they don't necessarily understand or have the time to understand previously so so yeah there was reports of you know improvement in parent engagement and parent understanding i couldn't agree more i i think you know i i saw a lot a lot more of my students parents uh, when i brought my teaching online um, during the lockdown period um and i think that mattered so much because they could see where I was coming from and the effort I was putting into online teaching. And I could also see how they were putting in effort to set up uh, the equipment just right so that their child could continue learning. And I think, you know, this effort on both sides um, and for each of us to be able to see that effort we were putting into it on both sides that mattered so much in building a good rapport. Um, furthermore, this idea of, uh, you know, online um the online medium enabling the educator to have a third eye into the into the students environment uh, it was a very interesting experience for me because in the academic class that i'm teaching right now reimagining pianism uh, we meet over zoom because it involves uh, students from other faculties and not just uh, yst um, and you know this is about the third iteration of the class already and i would say that i have never before known so much about the non-YSD students. Um, and just being able to look at the envir environment, I, I know which, sometimes I can guess which faculty they are from. And that opens up a lot of conversations on their own interests outside of music. And that's, that's a beautiful thing actually, because then, you know, one can make so many linkages back to music and it's not just only about music. And I thought that was really wonderful. It was an alternative, a uh, way in which to inspire the students. So that's about learning about an environment. Online teaching also offers the time for us to discover new sites to our students. Um, for me, I felt like when I had to move all my teaching online, um, it also provided a little bit of a, of a bubble for us to to work on these things because you know then they, they wouldn't have ABRSM exams to go for or um, you know school assessments um, yeah stuff like that or performances coming up we could actually get, get back to basics and I thought that was a good time for everyone to really uh, really fix those things that we've been needing to fix which do you prefer online or, or in-person lessons online Yourself. Mm. You need to rush all the way while I just go upstairs on the TV. When you were doing online learning, and I mean, you didn't have to travel so much, and I'm guessing that school, the expectations were slightly less vigorous, right? As yeah. compared to. Did you feel that you have more time for yourself? Yeah. More time to play? Yeah. Is that part of the reason why you enjoy online lessons more? Yeah. Things that they may not bring up or we may not even talk about in. Um, our regular lesson because of time and, and so forth but visually you can already pick up a lot of things which a teacher could use it to a benefit like talking communication understanding the student we also find out a lot about students right when we have this <laughs> online session because we have their background and their room oh and you know how their room looks like what paintings they have and then we can have all these informal um, conversations, uh, more casual conversations about their hobbies yeah, so I, and stuff. For me, I, I found it, this aspect fun. I mean, when, when lessons first went online at the start of the circuit breaker, um, I told the teachers that we're working with, uh, you know, I think we, we need to be really aware now that we are not teaching 
music, all right? But our job is to bring music to our students and have them find comfort, find joy, and find solace, especially during this period of, uh, during the circuit breaker period. And that and it actually struck me that actually that's, that's really the bottom line of why we teach music anyway. Um, but anyway, that, that was what I told the teachers. And I think that really struck a chord with many students. None of them um, quit lessons, thankfully. Um, and so that was great. And more than that, I found out so many things about my students that I wouldn't have before. For example, one of my younger students, I realized she has 11 hairbands all different colors, all different designs. And it was great because then, you know, the idea to create a listening exercise on cadences came about. So every time she heard one cadence, uh, maybe a perfect cadence, she had to wear a certain hairband. If she heard an imperfect cadence, she wears another hairband. And I mean, oral training never was that fun, right? So there was then, I had a lot of fun actually with this aspect of getting to know our students more. So here's the summary. All right, <laughs> further summary now. Okay, this was where we were before, right? Commun uh, uh, online teaching really took away from the oral and physical aspects of, of, of communication. It magnified the visual aspects. Uh, it's the gray areas that we were struggling with, correct? So now that, you know, we know that if we give more energy, we can make up for it. If we take the time to get to know our students better, we can still make up for it. And if we are observant of their home learning environment, we can also make up for it. So that's why I turn these gray areas into smiley faces. <laughs> All right, okay. And then going a step further, I realized too, and thinking about it that, you know, yes, I think it was a tough transition um, at that point in time. Um, but I think by and large, we adapted, all right? And that's why I put one more human quality here called adaptability. Because otherwise, we would have been gone during the ice age, but we're still around. So I'm pretty confident that we'll survive this um, and make the best use of online teaching, actually, which eventually would, would bring us to our next segment of the presentation. So yeah, so this is a, a huge summary, a diagrammatic summary of how I'm evaluating online teaching and humanness. So I'd like to share a teaching video, um, which I think exemplifies a lot of the points that we were just discussing. And this was me teaching lists or Raj, which means storm during an actual thunderstorm. It's a very threatening rumble. I'm going to write it. Down. Yeah, not half as frightening as the thunder I hear outside. You got to be more. <laughs> yes, that's much better. The next part. Thunder. Every single time it's happening, I have to stop speaking. I will wait until it's over first. Okay. I like. So this is going to be the piang. <clears throat> and then after that, bum, bum, three. So bum. yeah, that's that. I think you heard. <laughs> the good and the bad all captured all in one video. Everything that we're talking about, the drawbacks of online teaching. But, you know, it's all very funny. And this is a very fond memory that I share uh, with this particular student. So, yeah. Okay, let's go on for now. 
Oops. Sorry. Uh oh. One second. Here's the lag in real time. Oops. So this is me being vulnerable. All right. Okay, and here we are. <laughs> it takes us to the, to the final segment of today's uh, presentation. So moving forward, what are the possibilities and implications of online teaching? Now, I think that we have to deal with a lot of preconceived ideas on establishing rapport with students online. All right, so let's, let's hear what there is to say about that. I think it only works when you when when you have an original rapport with the teacher. Obviously, your first lesson wouldn't be online; it would just feel very impersonal. Right. The, the online lessons can only you know exist because of that previous relationship. You couldn't start a completely online relationship without first having had that kind of physical presence and you know establishing that rapport and having certain kind of memories and you know that that's that's what makes us humans. That's what defines you know. Relationships, yes. The memories. The memories of it, exactly, yes. So the, the rapport and the, the good times and the bad as well, you know. So. I mean, it's like a pen pal, right? So if one day, if your pen pal or your friend came and he said, hey, let's meet up, you know, I will find a bit, a uh, bit... There's a newness to it. There's exactly. Still, there's still a certain amount yes. of Yes, so you still need to have yeah. the initial get to know. Um, you know, especially in a group where not everyone knows each other, maybe their new group. Uh, like say for example, I, I coach a violin section in, in a um, secondary school and um, the switch to online teaching actually came at a point where they were a new batch of students. So basically getting them to um, get to know one another online, uh, you know, building the camaraderie, um, and uh, yeah, basically the team spirit and everything, uh, it, w it was a little bit difficult to adjust at the beginning, you know, people wouldn't really be willing to speak up, even when I um, call out to specific names, you know, it would take a while for them to respond and people would be a bit shying away from the camera, wanting to go to one side instead of staying in the middle of the screen. Um, so yes, I, I think definitely in a group setting, it's, it's a little bit, it really needs a lot more effort on the teacher's part to really engage and in, uh, get everyone to interact. So for example, if you're talking about like having classes with an overseas professor whom you have not met in real life before, the professor will be more curious to learn about who you are as a person um, and your culture if you don't come from where she comes from. So um, she will ask like more personal questions and ask you, especially with COVID going on now, um, would like to inquire about like the environment of how the virus is affecting like our space as compared to hers or his and like to me this like creates this uh, basis of connection initially already I think it makes the professor seem like they're more genuinely concerned about you as a student or whatever we do online may not be as amplified as it is in real life. So um, even like the body language might be more personal, more like, hey, how are you? Instead of like in person, it'll be like, maybe more of like, oh, how are you? Like the, the tone and the communication sort of tweaks a little bit to make you seem like you are in the same room as the person. Mm. It's, do you think culture plays a role? Yes. And yeah, I think it does. Eh? Because like American culture is like, like uh, they will freely like talk about their opinions. Whereas for me, initially, I was like, I was having trouble trying to like come out of my shell and like start speaking. But um, eventually, their warmth and generosity got to me and I, I started to feel more at ease. 
the very fact that we have to communicate online means we have to we do have to work harder at that so you could look at that as being a negative thing right um, it's more difficult to achieve but actually because it makes us work harder I think we dig deeper and find other ways other creative ways of finding solutions for it as well so um so in a way right, it's also, as it's mentioned Ryan positive. always finds the positive in the negative <laughs> but yeah so I, I mean but Back to this particular interview, um, I, I guess the question was, uh, you know, if you are meeting a student for the first time, not in person, but online, uh, would you still be able to build that rapport, that empathy and inspire that student, you know? And, you know, I, I think there are a lot of preconceived ideas here. And for me, I initially thought, ah, no, that's not going to be possible. But then when I listened to students who actually had that experience, I realized that actually maybe that is possible. And so, you know, there are two camps here, the yays and the nays. And uh, I think we probably need a bit more time to decide where in the yay or where in the nay we are, we, we are standing with that. It's worth exploring. All right, another, another thing is to be, aware, to be aware of student demographics. So let's find out more about what this means. One of the, the first challenges was just uh, around logistics, you know, and people having the right infrastructure and facilities at home. This actually, um, sadly, really uh, highlighted lots of kind of uh, differences in, you know, um, uh, in, in society where some people actually can't afford to have a piano at home and had always relied on going to their schools for lessons and things like that. So it was a bit tricky, actually, for some, it just meant that they couldn't actually continue with lessons. But, but for others, they didn't necessarily have the infrastructure or the internet and things like that. So, um, so actually, the report from teachers is it was quite patchy, because they, although they had a cohort of students, they couldn't consistently manage every lesson in the same way online. And we tap on the technology aspect and develop from there, I would say that is an advantage. So the advantage and um, the amplification is, you know, they have to be independent. And you know, kids are so, or the young people, they are so savvy in all this technology. In fact, they could even teach us. So they are very comfortable with that. Um, that's their um, tools. And that actually helps in their way of learning. So whatever, how they take on board, transfer things or whatever, you know, they are reviewing. So I think we're using it as a medium, as a gadget to get them closer to, let's say, uh, progressing in learning. You know, I, I feel that you have a great divide between like physical lessons and online lessons. Yeah. And then actually the gap narrows as the child grows older. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I thought that. Yes. Too, yeah. Be because true. especially the, the younger kids is like it's it's almost impossible to grab their attention. You know. Because especially with the younger children, I think you as a teacher, the lesson is actually a lot more a lot less predictable, right? So you have to be very adaptive as a teacher with younger children anyway. And then when they're on the other side of the screen where you have less control over the environment and things, it's quite tricky. So that was balanced or mitigated by having parents maybe assisting with lessons and being there. But then again, that wasn't always possible, you know. So uh, again, it could vary from week to week, depending on sort of parents' availability. And, uh, and whereas, of course, with the older children, of course, they didn't need that supervision necessarily. So um, it was trickier to work with the younger kids in some ways, even though kids themselves are used to digital interfaces and what have you. Uh, I think it was more a sort of attention thing. And uh, first year uh, violinist currently in YST. I taught him uh, three years ago, uh, regularly in Myanmar. I met him four years ago, but we only started lessons three years ago, like regularly. And um, yeah, he was, he's very, very motivated. He's very, very keen learner, practices a lot. And so we would have a range of um, different teaching modes online, uh, both synchronous and asynchronous, as well as uh, in-person sessions whenever he comes to Singapore or when I go to Myanmar. So, and um, I mean, that, that also developed more into less, less of a, I mean, also a teacher-student relationship, but also a, a friend relationship. I mean, I guess it's really rewarding that he's managed to really press on and, um, you know, take it forward into a 
conservatory environment now, having been uh, accepted into uh, Yong Siu To. So yeah, I mean, that's definitely, a, it really proves that um, online teaching, even at an advanced level, can be very effective. And so I think like online classes are more suitable for individuals who are like more initiated or more proactive because you already go in with like objective on like what I want to talk about. Whereas in-person classes might be more like teacher-led because the student just play and the teacher will give feedback and stuff. Like that. All right. Okay. So uh, actually, before I give my comments on 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 this segment of the interview, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, we do have a YouTube live chat going on. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. And of course, if you are viewing this. Um, after the live stream, all right. Um, don't hesitate to drop an email if you have any questions whatsoever. My email is muskhl at nus.edu.sg. All right. So do drop me a question if um, there are any that you need answering. All right. Um, but yeah. So back to what we were talking about. Um, it's in taking online lessons forward. I think it is really important to be aware of our approach. In other words, to be aware of our students' social economic statuses um, because they may not have computers or some may already have computers and be very adept at technology. And our approach to you know, these two um, differences, our teaching approach would definitely um, have to be able to cater to these two groups as well. Um, we also need to be aware of what the class dynamics are like. Are, are these students who are very motivated, are willing to take the initiative? Are these students who are young or who are slightly older? Are these students, um, you know, um, what is what, what are their personalities like? I think all of this matters in trying to shape an effective approach to online teaching. It is not a blanket approach, a, a yes or no question on whether online teaching works or not. So these are some of the things that we need to be sensitive to. All right, finally, sound quality. No one really talked about sound quality um, here, but it is really important, isn't it? I mean, for us as musicians, I mean, if we don't hear a good sound quality, how can we even talk about things like tone and expression? Um, right now, it is frustrating to be dealing with sound quality because what we hear over the mic sometimes what is transmitted over the mic um, and what we receive, all right? So there, there are two things that may not be quite up to par. Um, what I mean is that, you know, there is the technology to support that, but it is expensive. And so I don't expect teachers or students to have access to that right now. Um, that being said, you know, like 20 years ago, there were no handphones, right? Is it 20 years ago? Yeah, kind of. All right. And then after that, there was there were those handphones with the snake game, right? Anyway, point is right now, everybody, almost everybody has a smartphone. So I, technology advances. And I think in time to come, we will have access to really good sound quality and really good, fast, almost immediate connection as well. All right. Um, and recently, I was talking to a student from South Korea and she mentioned that she was experimenting with virtual reality teaching. In other words, the teacher on the other hand could actually be feeling the amount of weight that a student was using to play the piano. I mean, how crazy is that, right? I mean, wouldn't that totally erase all the drawbacks that we face with online teaching and the physical aspect of communication? So I think technology will advance and the question for us is, how are we going to use it in our teaching? So in conclusion, I think I can safely conclude that I am human, even when I'm teaching from behind the screen. <laughs> I think that, you know, an added human quality that we can add to everything that this whole episode has shown us is that we are flexible creatures and that Teaching online does not make us less human, but rather the question is how we project our humanness even through an online interface. Um, technology will advance, so I think online teaching will continue to open up more possibilities and it's our job to spot and make use of these possibilities. Yeah, so that's that. So do feel free to drop by any questions in the, in the chat. I think we have just one at the moment. 
and that is, um, in your opinion, what are some strategies we could adopt to amplify empathy in an online situation? That's an interesting question. I think my reply to that would actually be to first ask ourselves, what do we do to show empathy in a live situation? I think for starters, I normally like to ask my students, well, how has your day been, right? Uh, for private students, I always ask them things like, if your day has gone well, what do you like about it? All right, and that kind of leads into the into the lesson. Um, and also it gives you an insight into what their personalities are, all right, and how they're dealing with life in general. Okay, and you know, that is actually not difficult to do in an online setting, right? Asking our students questions. We can still do that in an online setting. So it doesn't actually take away from that in that sense. We can still continue to show empathy. The only difference is this. I noticed that when I set up for something online, uh, the whole setting up for online is kind of stressful. Uh, just like before this talk, I think we were, we were in, a, in a slight flux. <laughs> So sometimes in the midst of, uh, you know, preparing for, for, for the online lesson, it, we forget that we are talking to another human on the other side. And I think all we need to do sometimes as teachers is to remind ourselves what we do in a normal setting. Don't forget to get to know the student on the other end. Don't forget to ask questions and be curious about the person on the other end. Yep. Yeah. So I think there are no more questions for now, but if there are, do drop me an email at muskhl.nus.edu.sg. All right. So thank you for tuning in and uh, see you.